And coming out in the decades after that were the young Turks of psychology who despised this whole approach because they wanted to make psychology a science, a quantitative science, an experimental science. They wanted numbers, enough of this philosophy stuff. And out of it came this very deep, deep reflexive distrust of any behavior you couldn't see and you couldn't measure. And you didn't want to know what was going on inside anybody's personal life, inside their head, whether they were a fish or a human. All you were interested in is what was going on in the outside world just before that behavior occurred and what behavior was it. Simple organisms as input-output black boxes, forget this philosophy stuff, give me something I can measure. And this was this emerging discipline of behaviorism, which became the dominant school in American psychology by the middle of the last century. We've already heard from one of the starting founding fathers of it, and that was John Watson. That was the guy from the first lecture, give me a kid from any background and I'll turn him into a butcher baker or candlestick maker sort of thing, and that everything could be controlled in environment and thus you could shape behavior to any direction you want. Behaviorism sort of hit its heyday, its absolute apogee, with its most famous practitioner, who was B.F. Skinner. Skinner, who dominated, I think most studies show, or that he was the best known, most cited psychologist throughout the middle part of the last century, incredibly influential, and American psychology at the time was all about behaviorism. What are the key features of it? First one was this hysterical, radical, extreme environmentalism. The notion that we are all tabula rasas and whatever that is, that we are all blank slates and all that we come in with is this blank slate to be written on by environment. Don't tell me about genes, don't tell me about biology at all, don't tell me about anything other than what's going on in the environment and how does that shape the behavior coming out the other end and can I measure it. Extreme radical environmentalism in terms of gene environment inter there were no genes, there were no interactions as far as they were concerned. The next building principle was this notion of reinforcement theory. Let me control when any given organism receives a positive reinforcement, a reward. Let me control when it receives a negative reinforcement, a punishment. Give me the ability to control those in the environment and I will produce any behavior you want in that organism. Once again, whether it is a fish or a human and everything in between, this utter reliance on behavior is shaped by the rewards and punishments of, of environment, reinforcement theory. The final piece of it was this notion of universality, which is it works this way in everybody. It works this way in every single species out there. And if you want to study lab rats, you're going to learn the exact same thing as if you were studying giraffe, but it's a lot harder to study them in a lab. You sure don't need to study them out in their natural habitat because it's just understanding the reinforcements coming in, the behavior coming out the other end. They're all the same. This period, dominated by the behaviorists, was historically a total drag because these guys had just a stranglehold on the field. And all of them like looked the same. If you ever look in like one of those time life books on history of the mind or whatever, there will be the inevitable picture of B.F. Skinner with some pigeon, which and Skinner was like your archetypal you know, at a central casting behaviors. He had this inordinately shiny forehead and these big glasses and every picture of him, for some reason photographers were always forced to kneel down and take a picture of him looming over with his pigeon and everything considered this was an incredibly frightening looking man. And he would then be free to go on with astonishing quotes like, dog, cat, rat, child, doesn't matter, it's all the same this notion of universality of behaviorism. And Skinner invented all sorts of utopian societies. One, a book of his that was very influential, a novel called Walden II. You can build a perfect world out of reinforcement theory, all with environmentalism. And I could have built the exact same utopia studying this with grasshoppers as with humans, boy, cat, 
dog, rat, whatever, they're all the same. So the building blocks of American behaviorism, utter reliance on environmentalism, utter reliance on the notion that all of behavior could be explained, could be shaped by the rewards and punishments, the positive and negative reinforcements of environment. And this works the same way in every single type of animal out there. So you might as well just study it in a rat and a pigeon. Those were the two backbones of behaviorist research because they're a lot more convenient and you can study it in a lab because it's the exact same thing. It is purely a function of the environment you're controlling. And you understand that, and as long as there's some behavior coming out the other end that you could measure and generate numbers, you are doing scientific psychology, and this is what the whole field was about. 